And it has started. Okay, great. So this is the July 19th meeting of the WebRTC Working Group. The IPR policy is described on the link on this page, and only people and companies that are listed on the status page are able to make substantive contributions. And today we're going to cover WebRTC extensions and WebRTC PC. We will not be having an August meeting. The next meeting will be the TPAC meetings. And if you go on the working group wiki site, you'll see what we've got planned there. I believe we have two WebRTC working group meetings, and then we have joint meetings with the media working group. So that's the schedule for September, but nothing for August. A little bit about this meeting. Uh, the slides are up on the wiki. But we do need a scribe. We have a volunteer. A uh, scribe and note taking. I, I'll take care of it. Just a note on future meetings that TPAC registration has opened. So if you're attending the meeting either remotely or uh, physically, please do make sure to, to register. Oh, okay. All right. A little bit about the code of conduct. We operate under it, and it's on the link here. We're all passionate about improving the web, but let's keep everything cordial and professional. Um, the meeting is being recorded. If you want to get into the Q, type plus Q and minus Q in Google Meet chat to get in and out, um, please use headphones or an echo canceling speakerphone. Wait for the microphone access to be granted before speaking and say your full name, although at this point, with so few people, that probably we can recognize your voice. All right, a uh, little bit of note about document status. Just because something's in the repo doesn't mean it's been adopted. We have a call for adoption for that, and the editor's drafts don't necessarily represent consensus. The working group drafts do, uh, and sometimes we merge PRs with that lack consensus, but then we put a note to say that they don't. Okay, so here's what's on the agenda. We're going to spend some time on a few WebRTC extensions issues and then <laughs> talk about simulcast issues in WebRTC PC. Uh, and hopefully we'll get through in two hours and hopefully maybe even before. Okay. So first item is WebRTC extensions. And we got a couple of issues on the agenda, 71, 107, and 110. All right. So let's talk about 71. Um, long this up. All right. So this issue was filed by someone who was writing a terminal application. It also would apply to something like a PC in the cloud. Uh, and the problem they encountered is they had some congestion and the RTO backed off. Uh, I think the RTO initial is was three seconds, so it was pretty long to begin with. And then because of congestion, it backed off to 60 seconds, which was pretty intolerable at a terminal. And so the question is, what can you do about it? And the thing is, RTL max, min, and initial, they're properties of the SCTP connection. They're not per data channel. And so you can't set that on a per data channel basis. Uh, they're, they're, the recommended values are in RFC 4960, section 15. And the problem here is whether we can allow these values to be set under programmatic control. And the traditional answer to that is, is they require a lot of study. For example, in TCP, they changed some of these things in RFC 6298, but they had to go through a whole process to simulate what the effect would be. And uh, leaving that to the developer could be really problematic. You could see that they could set all kinds of weird stuff. Um, and the other problem is that in apps that do this, for example, I'm familiar with like cloud PC apps, they often use unreliable unorder transport, or at least for the for the keystroke portion of it. Um, and so they handle the retransmission or FEC themselves. So they don't get into this issue. They can implement whatever they want. Um, so the question is, do we really do we really need to provide this kind of functionality where an app can set its own Presumably, in in ordered 
reliable transport can set its own RTO parameters. Any comments? Let me put it this way. Are there any objections to resolving as one fix? I have a, uh, sorry, Tim here. I'm trying okay. to find the Q button, but um, yeah, uh, I have a slight, I mean, I, I see their problem. And, and I also think that these numbers, I, SCTP wasn't, was created in an environment which isn't uh, where we're running it. So the idea that these numbers are right is, yeah. mm, uh, I mean, right for then, but not right for us now, I think. So I, I kind of have a slight feeling that it would be, it's a shame to say no, but they're, they're definitively right. But on the other hand, I don't think we have alternate, I don't think we have a good API, and I also don't think we have a good uh um like alternate settings so i think that's uh, i think setting making these properties i think what i'm trying to say is making these properties public would be a mistake but having some kind of low latency config or you know fail faster config because what we're talking about here is actually how fast do we want it to fail if it's over congested i think what do you so mean by I, I, fail? reset the connection or well at some point it times out right okay to tie yeah so you're saying rtl max just set that small uh, no i i'm i'm think i'm making a meta point which is that i don't think that the, this suggestion is a good one i think the close won't fix is right but i think the right way to approach it was is with another config item which says we want low latency behavior mm, yeah. or something like that and 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 allow that to be a kind of meta setting rather than noodling with the precise numbers mm. yeah that's that that has probably multiple requests it's probably another issue but that would be a worthwhile thing to do potentially it's not quite this as it would be for me it could potentially be useful for media but Right, but 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 I think, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's multiple things that would like benefit from you saying we want it to fail faster and we want lower latency um, in the retries. So I, I since we're so few people, I put myself on the queue. But just a question uh, about what would this low latency mode look like i mean if if you just need to time out faster the javascript could could just time out after whatever number it wants right it could do a set time out 15 seconds and i haven't heard anything i'm going to assume it failed right well certainly in the uh if you did unordered unreliable yeah it set the timer for whatever you wanted and retransmit or not or do forward error correction anything so it does, an API doesn't seem needed for that unless there's some other functionality that's being asked for. Well, I, I think the stack probably needs to know, doesn't it? The SCTP stack needs to know that you've given up on it. Both ends need to agree that. So I think the JavaScript just, like what would your JavaScript do when the timeout went off to make sure that the other end was in agreement because i mean well, i can imagine myself having multiple channels that were labeled the same thing and some of them were older than new ones well there's max packet lifetime and max retransmits right right i'm just saying that maybe solving this at the down potentially the downside of solving this at the JavaScript level is that the two stacks in on the, either side wouldn't necessarily be in sync anymore.
I think um, I'm next in the queue. I'm just going to speak up. Um, there may be uh, different needs that are trying to be expressed there, and one of them is trying to know when a message has arrived on the other end and has been act, and maybe uh, that's some kind of functionality that could be added uh, to help um, with the issues that the application developers are having. Um, it might be orthogonal, uh, but it might also be related. If you want to know whether your terminal has successfully sent a command, you can just wait for a timeout or manual in your application, wait for an application control message, or just something from the stack telling you, yes, message has, been, has been delivered. And then you can retry on your own, and you don't need to have all those parameters. Maybe that's something also to consider. Um, so, uh, can I take it that we have consensus, at least on this call, to resolve as one fix? And uh, we can also file another issue for all the other stuff uh, we've just been talking about relating to the low latency. Uh, but this one recommendation is resolve as one fix. Okay. So, issue 107, uh, I think this came from Byron is that max frame rate shouldn't be allowed for audio. I, it was intended as a video only parameter. Uh, and the recommendation here is throw an error if it's used with audio. Anybody object to labeling this as ready for PR? Seems fairly obvious. Okay, I'll take that as that it's ready for a PR. All right, Florent, 110. So, in the similar way that we have uh, other accessors in a peer connection uh, object, like transceivers, senders, and receivers, um, we should probably have also uh, get data channels. Um, so I suggest we add it, and um, there's been a few discussions on, in different places about what should be exposed and what shouldn't be. And um, I've marked a few goals that uh, I hope we could agree on the API fulfilling. Um, one of them would be to listing uh, only uh, non-closed channels. Um, one issue is that you can create as many channels and close them. And eventually, uh, you might run into an issue that you have too many of those. If you have an uh, unbounded list, that might be a problem to keep track of all the objects forever in a peer connection. So uh, keeping only non-closed channels seem to be an interesting property. Um, it would be also interesting to uh, list all the channels that are created locally and the ones that are have been remotely created um, and received on the on data channel um, events. And uh, also, there's been discussions about whether this should be part of the SCTP transport or the peer connection. And I believe that should probably be part of the peer connection because the transport is only created after negotiation, but data channels can be created before. So if we want to keep track of all those data channels uh, properly, we should probably make this part of the peer connection objects. And then, um, yeah, that's about it. Any objections, comments? And if so, I will be creating a PR for this. I think this makes sense and uh, should hopefully 
solve some of our garbage collection issues, or at least solidify them as well. That a peer connection will hold uh, all these channels alive. Well, but, uh, this is Bernard. But garbage collection is a separate issue, though. It'll just tell you whether it has been garbage collected, right? Uh, yes. I'm just saying we have uh, some other bugs on this area that um, th th this fits nicely with the the model that the peer connection is holding them open. In order to enumerate them, you have to have references to them. Yes. So I like this. OK, I guess for the notes, unless there's any objection, we'll label it as ready for PR. Great. OK. Uh, sorry, was, was there some question around, um, uh, could we get some clarification on what you do with closed channels? Uh, sure. Um, I think that this shouldn't be part of the results. Uh, of gate data channels. If you keep uh, track forever of all the closed data channels, an application that lives for a very long time uh, may have uh, an unreasonable number of data channels that have been open. And so uh, keeping them alive forever might be an issue. Uh, I think the list of data channels that uh, is returned would probably match a list of data channels that have not been garbage collected as per uh, the garbage collection uh, section in the data channel part of the spec, which means the ones that are connecting, open, or closing. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, I think ideas can even be reused if you wait long enough. Yeah, exactly. Great, thanks. OK. All right, so now we have a long list of issues in WebRTC CPC, which hopefully we'll get through today. Uh, and we're going to go talk about these. So, uh, Philip, 2735. Yes. WebRTC specifies that we have to support this tilde character in simulcast offers, but the problem is it is IPR encumbered. and the pause stuff is not implemented by any browser. And what it means is that STP can control whether a stream gets sent initially or not by prefixing the read attribute in the STP with a tilde character. And that has two problems. One is an API level problem, because it implies that disabling a track via send parameters changes the STP, which will require triggering negotiation needed. And we don't do that anywhere else. And it's also a minor privacy problem because the remote site can theoretically re-enable any layers that are sent. And the recommendation is to ignore the tilde character in the STP and to remove the text about processing it from section 4415. And this tilde character and its Relation to the set parameter stuff is implemented in Chrome, but there's an existing bug, and Chrome does not implement RTP pause. And I think Mozilla does not implement that yet. Correct, Janiva? I believe that's right, yeah. So you have no objections to not implementing it at all, probably. And no objections. This sounds like a good idea to remove. Any objections to removing that text? I guess I the next... would... Yeah, go ahead, Laura. Um, I would suggest that we add uh, something that says that we should not support it at all to make it clear. Um, not that support the tilde. Yes, tilde or um, RTP pose for the reasons that are suggested here. Uh, I'm 
can put it. Okay, I guess the other thing would be to label this one also as ready for PR. So I, I guess the spec could talk about what to do if it encounters these, but you're thinking about us explicitly saying to not include this character in all person answers? Um, not include in browser generated offers and answers, but ignore when processing any remote <laughs> offers or answers. Okay. That sounds, uh, I don't know if that's generally something we require, but I also don't think there's a problem with saying no in this case, given the circumstances. Yeah, I mean, so, the app The app could always take look at the tilde and uh, Set in set the simulcast stream to inactive itself without having the browser having to implement. So it's not something that was ever necessary in the API. Hmm. Yeah, I think either way would work. Um, it seems like the original problem here is just that this has been implemented, so we want to be clear that uh, it should not be implemented. Um, so in that sense, removing any, I, I don't know, do we mention this tilde? And we don't mention it in WebRTC PC currently, right? Or it is we? mentioned in that one place in 4415. Hmm. So if we remove that, um, that's processing for remote descriptions. And then maybe also we want to say not to generate those. Uh, types of in the offer or answer. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yes, I'm not even sure we specify whether to generate it or not anywhere. Mm -hmm. I'll check. So wouldn't the uh, generation piece be part of JSAP rather than the API? So? I'll also check if JSAP specifies that. Good point. Yeah, I don't I don't see the tilde mentioned anywhere in JSEP, but we should check. But I can't find the reference in 4415 either. Might just be me. So the, the tilde is not mentioned, but uh, if you look at steps, uh, there's too many steps. But if you look for update the post status, uh, you will find uh, which which number which step number of yeah. which step of which step. Search for eight eight five three. That okay. should give you the right reference. <laughs> But I think it's actually easier to look for the text update the post status because finding your way into into this uh, five level. Deep, okay, I uh, see that. Yes. The post status. So we found it. Right. Okay. So. Philippe, are you going to provide a pull request then, or? I will. Great, thanks. OK. All right, so I think we've got this one resolved. OK, next one. Yeah, uh, Florent? Yes. Um, 
so right now we have um, in the WebRTC PC spec an enum that has uh, only a single value um, that is password uh, for ICE credentials. Um, it is extended in uh, the, another spec with uh, an extra value uh, OAuth, but it's not implemented anywhere. No one has, I believe, any plans to implement it. So I would suggest that we renew, we remove uh, uh, top level NM in WebRTC PC until someone uh, has a plan to implement uh, an extension for it and um, and ship it. If we don't, if we don't have anything like that, I don't see why we should keep it for now. Yeah, I I, um, I don't know that we'll never implement anything in the future, but as a as a matter of spec hygiene, I don't see a problem with removing it until uh, with the understanding that we we could bring it back once we have a second type. Does that make sense? Absolutely. If we have a second type, uh, it seems uh, warranted to have it. If we don't have any other type, I don't see why we would need it. Right, right now, we have uh, multiple browsers failing uh, WPT test because it is missing. And it's, right. There uh, seems to be yeah. enough history here that, that we, at one point, thought there might be multiple types. So that uh, the question of having multiple types shouldn't be an issue in the future if we can make a good case for a second type, I guess. Exactly. If we have right. a good case for a second type, a uh, solid specification for it, and an implementation because as right. we haven't had any implementation for the other attack, so. so. So first, plus one on removing this, uh, given that there is no momentum toward uh, the extension. Uh, I think one, and depending on how much we believe this extension still has value, one way would be to remove the enum from uh, PC and uh, move this as a, monkey patch in extension where the OS type is still being defined uh, or simply scrap it if we don't think this is going to fly anytime soon. Like, uh, I guess we could also treat it as a feature at risk, but yeah, generally um, sounds like a good idea to clean, clean this up. Yeah, I mean, we could move it to uh, the the whole credential type to uh, WebRTC extensions with the other, stick it in with the other remove features. <laughs> yes, but that would be good enough for me, I guess. Um, so, Florian, would you be working both on a PR and PC and one on extensions to, to do that? Yeah, so PCPR would just be removing references to it and mark adding it back to extensions with a feature at risk. Is that what we agree on? If so, I can do that. Yeah, don't, don't, don't bother on the feature at risk. I mean, add it wherever the OS thing is okay. defined. And yeah, it's in, the re it's in the removed feature section, so everything in that section is, is at risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can do something like that. So. We can address yeah, comments in the pull requests. So. There are more removed features than actual features. <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, I can do that. Okay, 2743, Yanivar. All right, and um, someone added a slide for me on this one, so thank you. Uh, I was thinking about adding one, but uh, um, this is actually leads up uh, nicely. I don't think this one's controversial, but it's a good stopping point to explain some a few things uh, that can be useful in discussing the next issue. So um, this issue, I feel, is more of a misunderstanding. Uh, it's, it's, it's more of an editorial mistake, I think, in that we have some language that says um, that you can uh, reject, an answer can re reject simulcast by truncating layers or saying uh, just one, um, which will remove uh, all RIDs. Um, if simulcast is not supported or desired, 
description rejects any of the offered layers or updates uh, and then modifies um, this internal slot call, called send encodings. Unfortunately, and I think this was a mistake, this runs afoul of some other language we have where we were, we were trying to prevent um, remote offers from modifying um, send encodings uh, beyond the initial offer, <clears throat> right? So we do support uh, SFUs and stuff of sending offers that can offer to receive things uh, simulcast. And, but there's a problem we wanted, and we were using this send encodings internal slot to say, well, basically if it's been sent already, that means uh, this is a second negotiation, this is a renegotiation, which isn't actually always the case. And one case where it, uh, collides is if we just add a PC and transceiver and you're providing send encodings in the API. In this case, when read together, uh, there's no way for an answerer to basically reject. Uh, if the answerer doesn't support simulcast, we've allowed it to basically, um, the intent was that uh, we, even though we offer simulcast, the answer can say, no, I don't support simulcast or, or I support simulcast, but with fewer layers and that should work. So. We should fix this language. Um, and that hopefully is not controversial. Uh, if if it is, please speak, to, speak so now. Otherwise, we can move on to the next issue. All right, I'm not hearing anyone. So, uh, the, so the resolution on this one, I feel, would be to fix the pros so that it doesn't, um, so that it continues to allow uh, answers to reject simulcast or reject layers on the initial offer. <clears throat> Next slide. And uh, <clears throat> so, um, oh yeah, there was more slides on this one. So uh, uh, this hopefully only explains what I was saying. It seems accidental because failing defeats the detailed modifications we had further down. And um, the, uh, the conflicting language was uh, about not allowing remotely initiated re renegotiation. Uh, so uh, next slide. Well, I think that's an, the next slide is a different issue. Yes, sorry. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I just wanted to just wanted to make sure we got the one the resolution to this in the notes. So we're going to label yeah. it ready for PR. Um, and I think actually what you've just said, Yanniver, about this one, I think it feeds into some other ones. Uh, and hopefully we can keep that in our brains when we get to those. Yeah. So to, to hope, sorry I was, if I was confusing things, but so far we've, we've talked about language that would affect even initial negotiation because yeah. you can do PC add transceiver before you've even done negotiation, which will, which will prime the send encodings internal slot, which causes, uh, that side to be uh, very rigid about not changing it, which could lead to failures that we weren't intending, such as the answer coming back and saying, yeah, I do support simulcast, but only one, uh, two layers, for example, instead of three. Or I don't support simulcast, but I still want it to work. <clears throat> I'm All not right. hearing any objections to that. So yeah. <clears throat> from here on, we're talking about renegotiation. So beyond the initial negotiation where everyone agrees. Uh, oh, sorry, there's a different issue in the middle here. My apologies. So hold that thought for uh, uh, another <laughs> issue. And here we're going to talk about something else, <coughs> which is that, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, we added a change to the spec, uh, which has not been implemented by anyone, which is that uh, if you get a set remote description with an answer, it can update not just current direction, but also direction. In hindsight, we think this was a mistake uh, because it creates a race between use of the API by the JavaScript, for instance, to set TC direction directly by assigning it a value, like for example, inactive or send receive, send only, receive only, or calling PC remove track, which is part, part of its algorithm is to set the direction. So these are direct intents from JavaScript. <coughs> However, uh, this can now race with negotiation or renegotiation, which is especially 
annoying if you've implemented perfect renegotiation, where the whole point was to uh, to uh, separate uh, renegotiation from the rest of your application logic. So now you have basically a race with your own separation layer. Um, and also implementing it now would probably break web compatibility. So the proposal is to revert it. And uh, the logic for this is that we think we got it wrong the last time, and that Stefan Hawkinson was actually right when you described the relationship between direction and current direction, in that these are separate. Excuse me. Excuse me. These are actually separate attributes, um, where direction reflects this side's preference in offers and answers it generates, whereas current direction reflects reflects the net negotiated direction. And we shouldn't have an expectation that these two values should allow. Sorry about the dog. Uh, basically, it's normal and informative for them to differ, and it keeps negotiation from being a lossy loop where if you have you know, uh, answers can narrow offers, but, but if answers can also narrow subsequent offers, then you end up with a, what I call lossy negotiation, and envelopes get sm smaller, and you can't undo it. So for example, a direction of send receive means we have stuff to send and are open to receiving. And the current direction of send only means the other side has nothing to send at the moment. But that may change in future negotiations. So these are independent attributes. Updating them should be deterministic to the application. And it's the nature of the negotiation that changes on one side don't always produce a net change in result. Any objection to reverting this? I'm not hearing anything. All right, I think that means we're good. Bernard, do you agree? <clears throat> All right, uh, next slide. <clears throat> okay, so now we're getting into a whole bunch of uh, rather complicated issues. Hopefully we won't confuse everybody. Um, and uh, But the basic problem here of 27, 22, 23, and 24 is potential contradictions between RFC 8853 and WebRTC PC. Um, what we're going to try to do here is navigate our way. I think we're going to do 27, 24 first, Yanivar, because that seems clear. Hopefully. Um, if people get confused, we can try to show you some of the text. I'm not sure that would necessarily clear things up, but uh, uh, we're going to try to get into this thicket and hopefully come out the other end. All right. Uh, well, actually, we'll start with 2722, I guess. Um, all right. So uh, this one is about uh, that. If you do a set remote description on an offer, you completely overwrite pre-existing uh, transceiver send encodings. Um, and the, the, basically, the language about how to handle Samacost and remote offer says that send encodings is completely replaced uh, based on the RIDs in the Samacost attribute. And that works fine if the transceivers aren't yet associated. Uh, but that doesn't seem right if uh, you or you have something that's already associated to overwrite them. Um, and so the question is, what happens uh, when it's an already associated transceiver? Uh, and we do allow a, a set remote description of an answer to remove pre-existing RIDs. I think Yanni Ivar talked about that already. You have the ability to uh, basically reject uh, Samacast in part or totally. Um, and we probably need to allow set remote description of an offer uh, to also remove pre existing RIDs as well. And there's a question about what, what happens around create answer if the offer tries to add a RID. And I guess the answer won't contain the new that new RID. Um, uh, 
Uh, and this is the problem, I guess it was with PR2155, which overwrote the existing transceiver. Uh, and I guess the question here is whether we agree with this issue in its characterization that we basically messed up in PR2155. So the intent of that PR was to allow um, uh, simulcast offers to uh, initially send uh, to to populate the layers uh, of an initial offer, but then the question is, uh, what is it allowed to do on subsequent reoffers? So I'm actually wondering, um, since I'm not hearing a lot of comments. Uh, I, I'm hoping my slide on issue 27, 24, because these are somewhat related, might help um, jog people's uh, memories around this. And, uh, I'm wondering if uh, if there are no no comments on this one, maybe we could do that slide first. Okay. Do you want to let's do you want want to go to 27, 24? That slide, I think that would help actually. Okay. Yes. That's this slide, right? <laughs> Yes, because okay. uh, I really want to ask you all what the what you think the intent behind a lot of this language was. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> it's not obvious, right? So we do seem to have very explicit language that says this specification does not allow remotely initiated RID renegotiation. That's a pretty strong statement. Um, simultaneously, the spec allows answers to reject simulcast layers in at least initial offers. But there's also, uh, together, this means, so how do we interpret these two statements together? Um, I would say, strictly speaking, that means that running the same, so one interpretation is, which I think is reasonable, is that um, if we run the same offer answer exchange again, that should succeed, provided the net result is the same the second time as it was the first time. So that's one interpretation. I'm wondering if the room agrees with that one. Because the alternative would be to say that, well, no. Uh, uh, well, let me use the example. Um, the RFC 8853 has an example with an offer to send three layers. And the answer says to uh, only receive two. I may have gotten this backwards. Uh, and that's, uh, it might have been an offer to receive three layers. And the answer is to only send two. It doesn't matter um, in this example. So, uh, but it's more likely that the SFU will be, will be the the offer, right? And then it can say, "I can receive three layers," and, and the client says, "No, I, I'm just going to send two. Um, so that's a narrowing of the envelope that happens in the initial offer, and everyone agrees that that should be allowed, and uh, that's also required by some of the RFCs. Now the question is. On a subsequent re renegotiation, if WebRTC PC is going to mandate that we, we, you know this has been fixed now, we can't allow any remote changes to that. Does that mean that a uh, off same offer answer should happen again, and that means the offer should send three, and the answer should receive two, and that's okay? And anything else should fail, or does it mean that no, because the first negotiation the result was a narrowing to two, we're not we're not going to reject the an offer we would have accepted the first time of three, and say now you have to offer two. I think that's a sort of constricting definition where the previous answer now adds new restrictions on future offers, and that means that the same offer again will, will won't be successful. That seems problematic just on my limited understanding of how SFUs often work and that they will just send out offers and say, here's an offer or, or ignore that offer, here's a new offer. And that could happen, for instance, when people join a call uh, uh, and for unrelated reasons that SFU will just spit out another offer and it's up to the client to keep up. So, um, 
so my question then, uh, maybe I should have just asked it. Uh, does everyone agree that running the same offer answer again should succeed, provided the, the net result is the same? Does anyone disagree with that? All right, I'm not hearing anyone, so I think that's good. So I've already put a checkbox on the first sentence there, which should a subsequent identical offer answer succeed because the net result is the same. So I'm going to mark that as a yes. So we have some other questions. What if the answer rejects, instead of uh, rejecting one layer, it rejects two, la two layers the second time? The net result is now one layer on renegotiation. Should that be allowed? Sorry about the dog. And there's some other permutations of that. What if the answer doesn't reject anything the second time, resulting in three layers? Should that still be successful? So I'll mute. Yeah, I guess RC 8853, right, allows any of these things. Is that correct? I think it does. Yeah, so that's that's the final question here, is whether anyone thinks that uh, if we were to fail these answers, would that, uh, that reject the previously negotiated layer? Uh, do we think that would violate RFC 8853? And uh, similarly, on the offer side, uh, can the offer remove a previously negotiated layer? And would that violate RFC 8853? Provided the net result is the same. So. This gets a bit complicated, but I guess the general question is, um, what modifications should we allow after initial negotiation? How rigid are we? Um, and it seems like we all agree that, as provided the net result is the same, uh, it should succeed. So a more narrowing question would then be, if everything is the same or less, meaning an answer can continue to reject more layers, should that succeed? Which I think is the hardest question. I think most would agree that um, the opposite shouldn't, it, you shouldn't be allowed to expand the envelope, but should you be allowed to narrow it? And uh, I'll take any thoughts at this point. Laura, do you have any thoughts? I agree with Yenivar. It makes sense. But uh, do you agree? As long as the, the result is the same, uh, I think we all agree that uh, it should succeed. But the question is, um, should we start failing answers that tries to modify the results, even if it's to narrow the envelope? No, because that's been the current behavior and part of the spec for a while. So I don't think we should uh, reject if you know it. Uh, right now we have, I believe, some limitations in some implementations that say that you cannot have too many uh, simulcast layers. So they are uh, trimmed after a certain point, and that's been a core feature for a while we relied on. So. If we don't have that, it's not going to work. Uh, that, that's good feedback. And I think the goal here is mostly to try to align with and not break existing uh, implementations. So we just want to make sure we align spec language with, with what's expected. But would you say, what about expanding the envelope? So if you allow constricting the envelope over time, should you be allowed to expand it again? either at all or back to the initial offer? I think back what do you to think the initial be? offer would make sense, possibly. But I don't see a lot of scenarios where that would actually succeed. Um, if the okay. client rejects it once, it will probably be rejected again. And that's fine, because it's going to be trimmed by the client again. So. I don't see the problem with that. Expanding it to more than were accepted 
uh, probably won't make any sense. Uh, I yeah. don't see the problem in rejecting it uh, because a client will just say, hey, you asked for 10 layers, but I can only do three anyway, so I'll answer three. Um, yeah. I don't think there will be an issue. Okay, I think that sounds good. And I apologize for using the word reject here because it's a bit uh, ambiguous what I mean. So, so you're talking about rejecting as in reducing layers, right? Yes. And uh, and there's also a question of whether we should set remote description should fail, which is another form of rejection, I suppose. Um, so it sounds like we have agreement that um, we should allow reducing number of layers, but not uh, increasing number of layers. Am I hearing that right? It's yes, uh, but it seems hard uh, to say, to keep track on how many layers were offered in the first right, right. Um, um, negotiation and in compare it to the subsequent ones. And so maybe that's not something that we should uh, think of and just resolve by saying the client can reject layers at will. And if you ask for more uh, later on, then you can reject it. Um, supporting it is another problem um, that we might want to say is allowed. But as far as rejecting it, it should be fine to reject. And if you ask for more, um, I don't see a problem in behavior there, for implementations at least. So uh, one thing we could say is that um, that's probably simpler is, uh, at least on the offer side, we could say that it, from if the initial offer is to offer three layers, then future offers can't offer more than that. That seems a fair li upper limit, I guess. But do we also want to say that if the initial answer was to receive two, that it can never be more than two? I'm trying to think of a scenario where you would ask for two or maybe one and uh, try to upgrade to two or three uh, later on. Uh, maybe that's some scenario that should work. Um, well, and I, in, it seems to me a, a lot of this, the, the idea originally was you just offer the maximum layers you could support and the other side would come back and the answer with the maximum layers they could do. And then they would adjust what they're actually sending with the active or inactive. Right, just and set parameters and just kind of leave it at that. So, I mean, part of the problem with the whole tilde mess is that it's trying to control what's sent and received using STP, which really makes no sense. So, uh, you know, the idea was to have a kind of a minimal STP surface here. I guess it's also fair to perhaps say that the original sentence of allowing remotely initiated re renegotiation. It's a pretty broad statement to, um, I mean, clearly if an offer comes in with totally different RID IDs and you don't recognize anything about it, we definitely wanted to prevent that. Mm. Um, so the question is um, uh, when the initial, the question I guess is when we set up, so uh, we set up the uh, simulcast envelope in initial offer. And I guess we need a clear definition of what, what the envelope is, is that, is the envelope the initial offer, or is the envelope the initial offer and answer? I think it's it's supposed to be the initial offer and answer, the combination of the both. Hmm. I agree. OK, so in this case, this example, then the, the envelope would be two layers, which means we would probably allow subsequent offers of three, provided the answer reduces it to two and in that case does set local description fail if it's if it doesn't reject uh, reduce it to two it gets complicated yeah it does 
So, yeah, that that's a concern I have is some of these errors that could result could be a little bit opaque. Hmm. So I think what we want to prevent is adding new spec language that forces implementations to to break. Uh, right, or or forces them to have very complicated error conditions. Right. Because <clears throat> I don't know that a lot of applications expect or, or handle failure of set remote description or set local description well. So um, I'm, I'm hearing some consensus to codify at least the, the top one as a minimum. Mm. Um, which means that the initial envelope is the initial offer answer. And, but that we could support, we should still uh, allow future offers that match the initial offer, provided the answer follows suit the way it did the first time. That's one way to go, I guess. But then it sounded like there was also um, no appetite for failing answers that try to further reduce the envelope. And then maybe even allowing such reduction, re, re, uh, reductions to be undone later, provided it still fit within the initial simulcast envelope. Mm -hmm. OK, I think uh, that provides at least some guidance for a PR. Yeah. Um, and I didn't hear any uh, any any thoughts on whether this uh, violated RFC eight eight five three. Well, I think the thing that is that eight eight five three gives a doesn't deal with the final cast envelope at all, right? It just is a just generic offer answer. So probably there's a ton of things that eight eight five three would allow that the API might not, but that's okay as long as it's clear. Well. 8.8.5.3 is about simulcast. Yeah, yeah, but it it I think it allows any of the things we just said we didn't want to allow. I mean, it's it doesn't mean we have to implement it, but yes, but but it, but it doesn't really uh, clarify. It seems to be mo mostly preoccupied with initial offer answer, or it doesn't seem to be talking about offer answer. What should if there's any difference between initial offer versus subsequent offers? Yeah, it, it says pretty explicitly that there is no difference. Right. Yeah. So um, that means that uh, is WebRTC PC's uh, limitation here in violation then? Uh, <clears throat> well, WebRTC has never implemented every feature that's in the RFCs. Mm. I don't know that it's in violation, mm. but um, right. But it seems so. Um, it seems like we have to have some and, and trying to maintain an initial uh, envelope at least seemed to have make some sense from an API perspective. Yeah. So um, the, the question is whether we can allow the intent of RFC 8853, uh, the spirit of it at least seems to be uh, to allow answers to limit envelopes. Right. So maybe we could uh, allow that within the initial envelope. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, in the example, uh, Bernard, the offer is to send three layers and the answer is to receive two. Would you say that the initial envelope is three or two? I'm kind of. Let's say it's two because that's it's a combination of both. Right? Well, the alternative would be to say that the offer sets the envelope. Uh, I think the envelope uh, it has to be considered the combination of the offer and the answer. So uh, sorry, I mean the envelope as in the max envelope that could be that would if you're outside of the max envelope, then uh, set remote description and answer would fail. Um, yeah, I mean, there's two separate things here, right? There's the envelope as a concept of what is allowed in set parameters, right? I think that's yes. the only way. That's yeah. the only way we've defined it in the WebRTC PC spec, right? I don't, I don't think we've talked yeah. about the idea of somehow one offer answer 
affecting what another offer answer could do because that's really more in the ITF's bailiwick, right, of, of offer answer. Mm. Um, and I don't think JSTEP talks about any of this. Does it? I don't think so. Well, I might clarify what things might. Uh, I don't. I don't think it mentions simulcast for sure. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Well, it does. It does actually has a simulcast section three point seven. Oh. It's pretty small. Okay. I don't think it. Uh, I don't think it really helps us here. Mm. Unfortunately. Yeah. So is this something that is actually more of an ATF question than an API question at this stage? Um, well, not really. I think it, I think we have some limitations that we want to impose, and um, right. But feels like this is a JSOP limitation uh, more than an API limitation. Or? Like, I mean, the, of course, the split between the two has always been very artificial. Mm -hmm. But uh, in practice, yeah, this is not so much about the API surface as much as about how the things are expected to work uh, in the offer answer negotiation, which mm -hmm. is more of a JZEP matter. Well, it'd certainly be useful to have more um, input from other people, but I think it's specific to peer connection, which is. Uh, a yeah. user of of uh, simulcast and clients and to uh, yeah yeah um, yeah i'm just looking at uh uh jsep section 3.7 there's almost nothing there about any of this it doesn't doesn't say a thing so i, I would say that we still own the the problem of adding a limitation in that uh if if we suddenly had to support offers that were widely different from the initial offer, I think uh, we would have to go back to the drawing board quite a bit. So I don't know that we want to do that. Yeah. Um, but it also seems that um, the current language is a bit too strict, and we should at least uh, modify it so that uh, existing use doesn't violate it, at least for sensible use. And uh, Determining sensible use might be where we were hoping for implementers to provide more feedback uh, what, about what SFUs are doing today. <clears throat> um, but um, so that's why I had these yes and no questions here. So maybe we could follow up uh, offline, or I could uh, post the same questions on GitHub, and we could uh, give people more time to respond. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to get all that much more response. Mm. Um, yeah, which is why I was also saying you you might have more success with ITF folks in these questions than uh, than with this group. Yeah, the problem is kind of the RTC web group. It's still alive, I think, but it's um, it's on by. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that it wouldn't. If you're asking them to rewrite RFC eighty eight fifty three, I don't know how how long that would take. I mean, um, I don't know that rewriting it is the first thing we would ask. Uh, like asking the intent would be maybe the first step. And if yeah. the intent is wrong, then of course that might imply some revision. But if it's just that we are actually okay or not okay, or I mean, it's hard to know in advance. So I would say that uh, currently we know that our limitation is too strict, and so this is proposing uh, uh, clarifying it to be a little less strict to match reality more. So I think we're moving in the right direction. So I yeah, think, and uh, the, we could do some PRs. Uh, and the direction we're right? moving in is clearly consistent with RFC AD eight fifty three. Yes, it's so moving. We're bringing it more into alignment. We may not bring it totally into alignment, but at least more is probably better. So yes, yeah, so more lenient. But still, if if we see RIDs that we've never seen before, uh, RID IDs, I should say, um, we would probably would probably still reject, uh, yeah. fail. There's some terminology issues here where um, when people say RID, uh, they're really talking about the layer, not necessarily the the string ID. And um, so, Yaniva, will you be? Doing the pull requests is that Byron? What's 
Oh uh, yes, I can I can work on a, a pull request with this. Uh, okay. And uh, I'll I'll check with Byron when he's back. So, uh, Yanevar, do you want to go back to twenty seven, twenty two, and twenty three? Hopefully, this will maybe clarify. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, I have let's... A, a small comment uh, before yeah. on twenty four. Um, if we allow to renegotiate the reads, that's at the SDP level. And we don't have any APIs in the JavaScript level to be able to do similar things. Um, right now, right. the only thing that would match would be set parameters, but we explicitly say that it should not trigger a renegotiation. So we don't unlow uh, changing the amount of uh, simulcast layers or change the reads. Right. Is that something will we want in the future to be able to have something that says, hey, in the next renegotiation, please have those layers. Or an extra parameter in set parameter that says, trigger a renegotiation because I'm changing the layers. That's something for the future to think about. So I'm not saying it. Well, I guess my question, time. Florent, is, is there a use case for that? If we allow uh, changing things at the SDP level, people are going to do it. and. I'd rather yeah. have an API than uh, have people mess with SDP. Yeah, I guess my, that we want. Uh, yeah, I guess my yeah. question is, for a lot of this stuff, the problem is, like you said, a lot of things you could do, but the question is, what, <laughs> why? Absolutely. Uh, th that's a good feedback, a good reminder that, uh, at least for the local client, the offers or answers that it sends out isn't going to change, right? Because uh, we're not supposed to allow modification of the SDP uh, before local answer. Right, right. right. So that might help uh, to make this um, these restrictions make sense. They might be inherent in the API, actually. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, so uh, uh, I guess we're, do you want to go back here, 27, 22? Um, I guess, uh, Yanever, is this, was this more or less a typo in, in the PR that we messed up or? So I think um, the original mistake there was to, uh, not that we don't handle there's a there's a case where you don't have any associated transceivers in which right. case we allow the remote side to populate uh, and create one but and there's a case where there is an existing transceiver and it matches but there's a case where that we didn't handle which is there's an existing transceiver and there's a conflict of encodings what do we do then and um that's a good question because um, uh, it also gets complicated because uh, the way we've specified it with internal slots, we're handling two cases at the same time uh, that are, uh, and one is that when uh, send encodings can come from add transceiver, but it can also come from a previous, uh, it, it can come remotely from, a, have, it can have come from the remote side on the previous negotiation. Mm -hmm. So if it's the latter, then then that's the case we just talked about that um, an offer we shouldn't allow remote renegotiation. So that should not be allowed. Uh, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, so, but, so yeah. I think what what we need to do here is carve out uh, so that uh, the original intent was to prevent the latter, which was. Uh, remote renegotiation and uh, we just need to add an uh, exception here for that we don't stomp on add transceiver do we uh agree with i guess there's two things that byron suggested here uh, and the question is whether we agree with them so we uh, as you said we allow set remote description answer to remove pre-existing writs should we allow set remote description offer to remove them as well um, it sounded like no for from the answers we had earlier, but I'm open to 
to hear if others agree with that. Yeah, so that's the case where like the SFU offers you less, uh, offers to receive less simulcast than before, I guess. Uh. So uh, the language here, the, the way it was written was, uh, is also the same language that has handles initial negotiation, which yeah. is why it has language about uh, the cases of not associated versus associated. Uh, and I think we just need to specify that if it is associated, then don't stomp on the existing send encodings. Right. Yeah, I think that's the right general direction. That's right. I believe you said here, overriding is prohibited. Yeah. Does anyone disagree with that? Okay, so we, I think we have a general direction on 2722. Um, and we'll also, it's, uh, I guess the resolution is to mark it as ready for PR. And then, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to review all these PRs and hopefully they're all consistent with each other. Uh, yeah. Okay, so now uh, 2723, which I think is the last one. Um, and uh, this is the pros around the simulcast envelope, what it means, and does it say that simulcast encodings can never be removed? Um, and uh, I had a problem with this issue, the way it was described, because it said once once the envelope is determined, layers can't be removed, but uh, I think we've determined that it you can actually, um, if the RIDs are rejected by an answer, they are removed. And I don't think that's uh, that's a contradiction with any of the sum, simulcast envelope text. Um, so I think that's okay. Uh, well, there's also a chance that the language was there. The language for removing layers it's the same language that uh, has to that does so in the initial uh, exchange. So the question is, um, is that what the language was intended for? And when reading these two together, it means this only removing only works in the initial offer answer, because mm. um, that would satisfy both criteria. Uh, or uh, it's the sentence. Once the envelope is determined, layers cannot be removed. Is that wrong? Because it, it seems hard to refute the intent on the first sentence. Yeah. Um, actually, let's look at. I think I have that. This is the full text that's there right now. Uh, and it was mostly that text was mostly intended to be about the interaction of STP and set parameters, right? So there definitely seem, but there are some flaws here already, and that's the add transceiver method establishes the simulcast envelope, which was true originally, but then we also added uh, the ability for uh, the remote end SFUs to right. offer to, re to receive simulcast. So there's actually two ways to establish the envelope now, at least. Yeah, and actually, it's not really if you really if you believe that it's both the offer and the answer, that sentence isn't really right, right? When you say you establish a simulcast mm -hmm. envelope, it, 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 right. if you haven't had a software answer, what does that even mean? Well, well, that that would support the theory that I threw out, which is maybe the envelope comes not from offer answer, initial offer answer, but from initial offer, which would be right. um, similar to Adrian Sieber. Hmm. So maybe that is the um, that is the outer envelope which is described as a maximum. So in that case, the example we've been using where the offer is for three and the answer is for two, the envelope would be for three. And which means we could allow, we could, we could enforce three as a limit, uh, which would allow, uh, which is quite flexible, I think, and it allows an answer to, uh, 
reject, uh, sorry, to reduce the number of layers and increase the number of layers up to that number three in this example. Uh, Florent, do you have a comment on this? I, I think there may be a problem with this text. Sorry, I didn't spend enough time uh, looking at this. Yeah, because it's it's trying to it's um if 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 we agree that if we think that some the question is is the sonolent cast envelope established by a transceiver or by the completion of the over answer exchange? I would say probably by the completion of the author answer exchange because if right. the remote rejects some layers then you want to see that in your uh, parameters later on right. that are in your sender that is in your transceiver. So one of the things that this seems to say, and I'm wondering if it's actually true, is that uh, once you call a transceiver, you can't change the envelope by calling set parameters. Correct. So like I, I set it for two layers and then I call set parameters with three, it's going to fail. But that's what this would seem to imply. If it's set by the combination of the offer and answer, then maybe it should succeed. Is that right? Well, I think it's useful to, I think this text here was, it's useful to remember that originally, we only supported the first modus of operandi, which was that uh, if you wanted simulcast, you had to use add transceiver. That was how right. it originally worked. And this text makes perfect sense then in that add transceiver sets the maximum envelope, which is the offer being sent to the SFU. And the answer is now uh, free to uh, reduce the number of layers as much as he wants. Uh, and that seems fine. But it's the 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 new way we added the inverse, which is uh, where the SFU is the offerer, uh, and then on an initial on center mode description of that offer, we will now associate a transceiver and populate uh, the encodings uh, that way instead of through add transceiver. And so in that case, I would say if we use the same logic, then it's not add transceiver, but it's the set remote description initial offer that establishes the simulcast envelope, um, I would say. And that uh, we then, that becomes um, the limitation at that point. So that uh, the, the initial offer is treated as special. It would be one way to do that, to, to mimic how add transceiver works. We may be overlearning the term simulcast envelope in that it there may be there's multiple things I think we have to figure out here. One is interactions between a transceiver and set parameters, what we allow and don't allow. And the other is all the other offer answer interactions that you've described earlier. And those I think using the term simulcast envelope may not be helpful because it's it's confusing, very confusing the way it is right now. Yes, I, th I think this this clarifies that uh, the original term was defined by add transceiver, uh, right? That's the only way, and we, we, which means we haven't even asked the question of uh, does it make sense to to enforce if the SFU is controlling the offer, does it make sense to enforce an envelope at all? And uh, right, that's a question we need to answer. And uh, that would be this meeting. So <laughs> if anyone have, has thoughts on that, please. Uh... Uh, Florent, do you have any thoughts about how to how we can help clean up this mess? I mean, changing the envelope through set parameters uh, after negotiation is definitely not something we want to be able to do as is, because that would imply a renegotiation later on, um, I believe. Uh, but before negotiation, that may be something we could allow. Um, I don't have a lot of opinions about the rest. So. I need to dig more into. Uh, yeah, I mean, we issues. don't. I mean, one question is, you know, we don't necessarily have to allow stuff if there isn't a use case for it. Um, all I'm reacting to here is that it just seems really unclear what's allowed and what's not. 
Um, so if I read this, I wouldn't have any idea. And it, it, we're just conflating so many things that I wouldn't have any clue as to what should be allowed or what to expect. That's my problem. So I think uh, one thing to look at would be if there are SFUs out there that uh, that will offer, say, two layers and then immediately send another offer with three layers. And uh, that if that were allowed, it might confuse JavaScript quite a bit because I think the expectation right now is that once you have a remote offer that creates a transceiver for you, that you can go and inspect that transceiver and that that, will, that transceiver will not change except in the ways which you can modify it through set parameters. So the number of layers should not necessarily change at that point. I think that might break JavaScript applications. And we already have the active mechanism to sort of um, turn on and off layers that are being sent because the the client is the sender always. So, so I, I could try to do a PR that uh, clarifies and establishes a simulcast envelope from add transceiver or from the initial set remote description answer that populated the transceiver. And that might be, uh, does anyone think that is too limiting? Well, maybe the right term for what you're talking about might not be sign some cast envelope, might be something else. Um, you know, I, we have we have a bunch of you have a bunch of I think some cast envelope is the right word to use in the issues that relate to what the offers and answers can do relates to negotiation. But if we're trying to figure out what how the in potential interactions of add transceiver and set parameters, that might not be the right word. Um, so we might think about whether there's some other term that we could use for that before the uh, offer answer is complete. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe. I'm not sure which term uh, you're thinking of. Uh... Well, because this part of it is in this first second paragraph is it's trying to describe what set parameters can do. So, you know, can you use set parameters to change the number of encodings before you even do a complete offer answer? So that's one series of questions, and um, and I, I think the term simulcast envelope may not be quite right for that. And then there's the whole question of, what, of the other set of things you raised, Yanivar, which was, you know, changing things and answers and you know reoffers and answers and all that. And then the simulcast envelope term may may be the correct one for that, even though uh, in some cases that isn't even clear to me, because it, it, I think the purpose, the overall purpose of this paragraph was to try to tell you what set parameters, what was legal in set parameters, and what wasn't. And that was kind of it. It wasn't trying to determine all of the, uh, everything that every uh, you know result of an offer answer exchange. Uh, it may well, have, may have been over applied. So in order to iterate, maybe we can iterate on this by saying I, I didn't hear any objections to the first line when I had a checkbox on, which was that right. everyone seemed to agree that if you got the same offer answer exchange again, then everything that should succeed. So we can at least uh, loosen, since our current language is even stricter than that, uh, we can at least uh, clarify that piece maybe. Right, right. Yeah, because that that fits the def, you know, that fits the definition of simulcast mm -hmm. envelope being the combination of the offer and answer. So if that combination results in the same thing, there's obviously no issue there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. We have uh, a good point about set parameters happening before the answer. Right, right. That. Yeah, and there maybe the right thing to do is to just figure out what implementations already do. I don't know that you know, yeah. Florin, has there been this cry to change it? I I don't know. I haven't heard anybody saying, "Oh, this is horrible. It needs to be fixed." Um, Not that I know of. I mean, so. usage usually is pretty static. You negotiate something, and it's fair. exactly right. Doesn't change that much. And since you're talking to an SFU. It's usually about receiving one stream, and you send 
um, maybe some cast so there's only one of them so there's a very limited uh, amount of renegotiation and will to change things right i think that's a good way to to progress and uh we'll just move in slow steps and uh, a lot of these issues were filed uh, because uh mozilla is working on uh, implementing set parameters so as long as we can uh, clarify the needs a little bit more, we can make progress. Yeah, I think moving slowly is a good idea since half the changes we make, we have to be reverted. <laughs> yeah. OK. So let's see what else we have here. Uh, yeah, so for 2723, I think, is this? Do we actually even need this issue, or has have we covered pretty much everything here with 2724 and 2722? I think we know that simulcast encodings can be removed. So anyway, I think this is an issue really about the whole text of simulcast envelope and the fact that it's very confusing. I think we can agree to that. Um, But if we can agree the behavior we want, it sounds like we agreed that we can allow renegotiations only if they produce the same result, which is right, right. Um, right. solves a lot of uh, the questions, which means that the a lot of the language, language about removing layers, while true, you can only remove layers if you did it the first time in order to produce the same result. So right. the net result should be that JavaScript has a consistent, when it's reading get parameters, uh, what it's reading shouldn't really change uh, after initial offer answer. If you call it before initial offer answer, you might see a change. Okay. But that seems unavoidable. OK, so can we write that down in the notes as the answer to, I guess, the second question about renegotiation? And then uh, for the first question, I think we believe that, that we need to clarify the simulcast envelope language somehow. Um, I don't know that it's a contradiction, but it's confusing. Yes, I'll, I'll take an action to do a PR there. So I think that's, let's say that's how we resolve 2723. And uh, I think uh, that's actually it. I think that's it for all the issues. We finally got through them all. So that means we're rewarded with a picture of a yellow bellied slider turtle, who is a very slow and deliberate mammal. Where is the bird? Well, he's not a bird, but um, I actually did get a picture of him where he was moving fast enough to actually blur the picture, which was very surprising. But in this particular picture, he's just walking uh, very, very slowly, putting one foot in front of the other, or a paw, I guess, in front of the other. And he was out on the boardwalk in the sun. So I just thought it was tiles, not too far from one another. So. Yeah, I thought it was a good analogy for some of these bugs. That it's better to move slowly and deliberately because he's not really good at walking backwards. He can go forward, but slowly. Yeah, slow and steady steps. Yeah. OK, so I guess what we'll try to do is come up with PRs for this stuff. And in a subsequent meeting, we do have time at TPAC. I guess we have we'll have six hours uh, for our our stuff, and uh, so hopefully we can make some progress on some of these uh, issues as part of that. Um, and I probably will call for other agenda items for TPAC just to make sure we, because we, we will have extra time. Uh, I think everyone's seen the. Uh, uh, pandemic related requirements of TPAC. I guess people will have to get tested every day. Will the test be provided uh, 
Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it will be a hybrid meeting. Uh, so some people can be remote, I guess. Uh, Dom, they'll have all the equipment, right? So we can do remote stuff as well. Uh, correct. Yes, we'll be using the Logitech Rally Bar so that we have a good hybrid experience. Okay. Um, and uh, the registration and stuff has been posted. So if people, I guess, need to respond to that, um, I guess it's up on the web page, Dom, for TPAC 2022. Uh, correct. And I guess. Okay. All right, so uh, unless anybody has any other items, I think we're done for the day. And we will see you all at virtual or physical TPAC. Great. See Thank you. you. In September. All right, see you then.